Thank you, sir. May I now invite on the dais Tenzin Sundwe, uh, sir, poet, writer, and Tibetan activist. He won the first ever Outlook Picador Award for nonfiction in 2001 and has published three books till date, which have been translated into several languages. His writings have also appeared in various publications around the world, including International Pen, Outlook, and The Times of India. He is currently the General Secretary of Friends of Tibet, India. Please, sir. And 
Um, and also as a, as a young Tibetan, thinking that uh, we have to fight for the freedom of our country. And, and we, have been, we have been thinking that, that the rest of the world does not know about Tibet. So for that, I need to write in English so that the rest of the world will be aware of Tibet. So from childhood, when I was in fifth standard, I took a promise to myself that when I grow up, I will be a freedom fighter and I want to be a writer. Okay? And I said to myself, this pen today, even today, I keep very close to my heart. I said, I'm going to be a writer. I, ha I didn't have English, but I knew that I have to do it. At the time, our school didn't have a library. So my first lessons in English, I learned from Tingle Comics. I, I read Tingle Comics, whatever little I could understand. With that, I was able to tell stories to younger children. So much later, I'm uh, looking back in, in the ways we were growing up in Tibetan Refugee School, where uh, we were told that there is an R on our forehead. And R means refugee. So we were, we were thinking that we are all refugees, but good thing about being refugees is that we don't have a country. And good thing about not having a, our country is that there is a big hope. For that there is so much things to do. And that was so very hopeful and so very inspiring that we have great things to achieve. And refugee never meant anything poor or derogatory or painful or sickening. No, for us, refugee was the most inspiring thing in our life. So I grew up thinking of that. And looking at that, I wrote this poem called Refugee. So this poem is titled Refugee. It says, when I was born, my mother said, you are a refugee. Our tent on the roadside smoked in the snow. On your forehead, between your eyebrows, there is an R embossed. My teacher said, I scratched and scrubbed on my forehead. I found a brash of red pain. I am born refugee. I have three tongues. The one that sings is my mother tongue. The R on my forehead between my English and Hindi, the Tibetan tongue reads Ramzin. Freedom means Ramzin. So I kept on redefining myself that I'm not what I'm being <coughs> described upon. I am who I want to be and that is independence, freedom. So, looking back in past times and also looking at how we are today, I kept on writing. So, I started writing poetry very late compared to many other writers. I started to write only when I was in Bombay University. I was there for uh, five years and I was really fortunate that that was the time when, when some of the stalwarts of Indian writing in English uh, poets were there. I made friends with Nisim Ezekiel, Don Morales, uh, two very important Marathi writers, Arun Kulatkar and Dilip Chitre. And Arun, uh, Arvind Krishna Merotra from Allahabad University used to come down to Bombay. I was friends with Adil Jasafada, who later became my mentor uh, in writing. So I was there at the time when these people were still alive and some of them even looked at my own writings and corrected my writings. So I was fortunate that I was there at, uh, at such an interesting moment. For example, when I show some of my writings to Nizam Eskil, Nizam used to say he was very strict about punctuations. And when he looked at some of your writings, if there are no punctuations, as today we say, you know, free and we can write in any way we want. But if there were no punctuations, Nizam would refuse to look at your writing. He would say, if you need to pause, why do you stop with a full stop? Pause with a comma or give a long dash. Think properly and when you are when you're done, come with a full stop. You would be very, very strict with punctuations. And today, of course, uh, liberal, liberal new writings would not adhere to stanzaic writing and also, uh, uh, you know, poems dressed up in punctuations. But I would still fall in that category of rich writing where 
punctuations are proper. At the same time, there is uh, rhythm both in the thought as well as uh, the music. And therefore, cadence is so very important there. Um, this, is, this is one of my first poems written in Bombay. This was written when I didn't have a place to stay in Bombay. Uh, I was a university student and, um, and also because I didn't have um, support from many other people uh, there was a time when I used to survive on just one vada pao and cutting chai for a day but I attended my university lectures, uh, done my assignments and by then I made friends who were having big houses on what is called in posh areas like uh, Bulabai Desaru, Waterloo, in Kafkore <coughs> And I've been to some of these houses where there was poetry readings or high teas or discussions on poetry. And whenever, whenever I were in these houses, I felt like saying, can I stay in your house? And because at that time I was staying in, in friends' houses, my classmates' friends, like one month in uh, Char Bangla, uh, uh, 20 days in Burivli, uh, 10 days in Ramesh Nagar, in Amboli, you know, seven bungalows, uh, or in Bandra, in different other places. So, I felt if I could feel like making that proposal, I could very otherwise very well write a poem about it. So, make a proposal. Quite a dangerous one. So, the proposal basically says, can I stay in your house? And I made 20 handwritten copies and gave it to 20 rich friends who had big houses. Now, yes, so it's it's quite audacious for the poets to write the po poetry and g give it as a proposal. Now I'll tell you the results of that later. I'll read the proposal first. So the proposal says, pull your ceiling halfway down and you can create a mezzanine for me. Your walls open into cupboards. Is there an empty shelf for me? Let me grow in your garden with your roses and prickly pears. I'll sleep under your bed, watch TV in the mirror. Do you have an ear on your balcony? I am singing from your window. Open your door, let me in. I am resting at your doorstep. Call me when you're awake. some of my friends and ask them, did you consider my proposal? <laughs> and they were saying, Tenzin, what proposal? I said, Are the proposal I gave you in the form of a poem, did you consider? And they were saying, oh, I thought it was just a poem. <laughs> <laughs> the accusation of art for art's sake. The accusation yeah. of art for art's sake. I was seriously meaning. Um, so I continued to write. So, but then <clears throat> what really worked, what poetry does to me, is it uh, assembles me, it organizes me. The, uh, my anger, my imagination, my regrets, my desires, my resistance, my slogans, my fantasies, all of them are being brought together by poetry. And when I am writing, when I finally bring down all of that with sparked by an inspiration, when I'm finally coming down, I see I'm one. Or else I'm everywhere. I'm the past, I'm in the future, I'm sometimes I'm stuck somewhere, I'm still thinking about a what about I had some sometime in the bombing. But when I'm writing, my writing brings them together. And my writing also helps me intellectually understand my own personal being and the condition in which I am born into and the life that I am making sense of today. At the same time, it helps me to envision a life for future. So what poetry does to you is no other artwork can do. So therefore, poetry is so very important. This afternoon we were having amazing discussion there about the landscapes of, of the mainland and the periphery. So I was saying, if 
if we at, at all have to look at the mainland and the periphery, it's you. You are you are periphery. You are everywhere. But when 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 you are writing poetry, all of your peripheral elements come together, and the mainland is created, and then the poetry comes out. Um, what it also does is it it questions establishments, establishment that is not just the government, establishment of stereotypes, establishments of notions that you believed in. You need to question. We need to go back to it. And this is what I think. And sometimes when I look at the Tibetan exile community, I sometimes feel that we are too well settled. We are spoiling ourselves. We may be forgetting to go back home. So I'm questioning. So therefore, this poem comes out, a poem called Exiled House. In this poem, there is a Tibetan word used, Changma. Now, Changma is a flexible uh, uh, middle height tree, mostly planted on the fences. It's flexible and doesn't break in the wind. And if vegetative, you cut the, the branches, it will grow back very fast. That's Changma. So, this poem, Exile House. Our tiled roof drift, dripped, and the, four, and the four walls threatened to fall apart. But we were to go home soon. We grew papayas in front of our garden, chilies in the garden, and changmas for our fences. Then pumpkins rolled down the cowshed patch, calves trotted out of the manger, grass on the roof, beans sprouted and climbed down the vines, money plants crept in through the window, our house seems to have grown roots. The fences have grown into a jungle. Now, how can I tell my children where we came from? It's, for me, it's frightening to think that we may settle here and we may never be able to go back. Now, here is a poem that has nothing to do with Tibet as such. But at the same time, it has everything to do with a kind of a life that is we generally see. Um, uh, there was a point of time when I was invited uh, for the first time out of India as a poet to South Africa. I was going out of India for the first time and I was reading there as a poet and reading. So we were told to write a poem in a span of five days. And I was able to walk around uh, Durban, the city, and just, I've met a number of young people. And I'd seen uh, drug addiction, I'd seen uh, um, juvenile, uh, uh, you know, delinquency, I've seen juvenile pregnancy, a uh, lot of problems. At the same time, very, very young, throbbing youth who are also inspired and willing to do things. At the same time, I met this uh, Spanish poet and this musician called Pedro. Now, this man is such an amazing musician. He could touch anything and he could make music out of it. And once he drew out one stump of a plastic pipe, he was blowing from the top and using the index finger from below, he could make a flute out of it. Now, inspired by that, I wrote this poem. So this poem, uh, the poem is titled Pedro's Flute. Pedro, Pedro, what do you have in your flute? Is there a little boy who is, who has lost his mother and is running all around the town, bare feet, slapping wet cobblestones? Pedro, Pedro, tell me what do you have in your flute? Is that a soft moaning of a young girl Pregnant at 16, thrown out of her house and now living in the public park behind the toilets? Wonder how you blow a stump of a plastic pipe and how it comes alive into a flute. A flute with no eye or ear or mouth. Whistling, now crying, now singing. Whistles that turn into small needle arrows Arrows that sting even the hearts of owls, 
owls who have hair in the ears. Pedro, Pedro, tell me what you have in your flutes. <coughs> Is that the whistle in the hinges of the window, the cry of a young girl? Or is that now the tired sleeping at the police station? Pedro, Pedro, tell me what you have in your flute. I would request if, if there can be some silence in the moment. You know, it's a bit disturbing. Uh, the other, actually the audience. Yeah. <clears throat> now this poem, um, and after, with this I will, I will, I will rest. I'll, I'll get back to my place. Um, so this is my final poem uh, this evening. This poem is called "When It Rains in Dharamshala." Now uh, some of you may have uh, come to Dharamshala. Some can I can I see by hands if any anyone who's been to Dharamshala? Okay, one, two. Okay, fine. So uh, Dharamshala is is a place for, for, for Tibetans, actually in true sense, Dharamshala. Because we are there temporarily. And we hope that one day we will go back to our own country and we will be able to return Dharamshala back to India. Uh, but a number of tourists come to Dharamshala. Uh, Dharamshala is one place in India, after Chirapuncha, we get second highest amount of rain. And there is so much of rain, that what we call in English language, it rains cats and dogs, but in Dharamshala it rains cats, dogs and donkeys. What a big So much of Barish. And these uh, cheap Chinese umbrellas people bring, they go tatters like tissue papers. You need Jalandar Chata, you know that tall one with iron, uh, the steel rod in the center, you need all that. So if you ever want to come to Dharamshala, Come to Dharamshala, not during this tourist season, April, May, and June. There's so much tourists, and the problem is that we are there, we are and Dharamshala is so small. So many tourists come and say, we lose our own friends. Yeah, where are you standing? <laughs> local public, local people have a problem. But if you're coming at all, if you plan to come, come during the rainy season. Because Dharamshala is most beautiful during the rainy season. It's not the rains, it is in between the rains when the rains have stopped, when the sky is clear and from the perch of McLeod Gunch you can see the whole Kamra Valley in minute details down. You can actually count the houses. There are these small patches of pine wood forests in there were stretches of road where the local buses come and then vanish into the forest. And further down you can see the Pong Lake. And beyond the Pong Lake, you could see rivulets feeding into the Pong Lake. And there's only half the scenario. You turn and look up to the mountains. There is a majestic Doladar mountain range. And then the snow peaks. And then the rocky mountains. And then also the pine wood forest. This is what you get to see in Dharamshala when it rains in Dharamshala. In this poem, it's, the poem talks about a room, a rented room in which I am living in Dharamshala. So this is the poem. It's called When It Rains in Dharamshala. When it rains in Dharamshala, raindrops wear boxing gloves. Thousands of them come crashing down and beat my room. Under its tin roof, my room cries from inside and wets my bed, my papers. Sometimes the clever rain comes from behind my room. The treacherous walls lift their heels and allow a small flat into my room. I sit on my island nation bed and watch my country in flood. Notes on freedom, memoirs of my prison days, letters from college friends, crumbs of bread and Maggie noodles, rice sprightly to the surface, like a sudden recovery of a forgotten memory. Three months of torture, Monsoon in the needle leafed pines, Himalaya rinsed clean, glistens in the evening sun. <coughs> Until the rain calms down and stops beating my room, I need to console my tin roof, who has been on duty from the British charge. This room has sheltered many homeless people. Now, captured by mongooses and mice, lizards and spiders, and partly rendered by me. Thank <laughs> you.
A rented room for God is a humbling existence. My Kashmiri landlady, my Kashmiri landlady at 80 cannot return home. We often compete for beauty, Kashmir or Tibet. Every evening I return to my rented room. But I'm not going to die this way. <coughs> there has got to be some way out of here. I cannot cry like my room. I have cried enough in prisons and in small moments of despair. There has got to be some way out of here. I cannot cry. My room is wet enough. Uh, so with this, <clears throat> I will conclude here. Uh, I've been an activist uh, for now about 25 years. Uh, when I say activist, uh, you know, it's not just the protest narabazi. For me, activist, the work is most importantly doing what the government and the parliament cannot do and is not willing to do. Okay. So there is a lot of work. Individuals must step forward and take it. And this is the work of an activist um, and also as a, as a poet. So they work wonderfully together. Poet is the one that is offering the creativity and imagination of an otherwise impossible and unimagined world. And the activist is the one, the action man, who goes out and does things. Yeah. Um, and this, uh, because of my protests and various other things, I've been to 15 different jails. And that's a kind of a, my own personal record because I've been to jails in so many places, jails also in, in inside Tibet also. So some of my Indian friends are saying, if you've been to so many jails, you should actually write a jail guidebook, which will be useful for Indian politicians. <laughs> <laughs> um, but at the same time, my writings is taking me to 20 different countries. I've been to so many countries speaking. But now with this, uh, my concluding thing is, you know, poetry uh, has become my life today, my, my livelihood. And poetry alone is what I do. When I read poetry, when I sell books of poetry, people often ask me, what other things do you do? What is your job? For me, poetry is my job, poetry is my livelihood, poetry is my life. I make it so very simple. And uh, uh, to such a point that, you know, this is what I do. I bring together all my, uh, you know, books, uh, you know, writings, publish books or poems like this. I sell this. And I travel. I travel 20, 30, 40. Today is my 51st day on my speaking tour. I've been all over India, now here. Tomorrow I'm going to Delhi. Again I'm traveling. So what I do is usually on my journey, I carry uh, two to three hundred copies of my book and tell stories, read poetry, encourage, inspire young people to write and sell my books of poems with this <coughs> I'm doing. Now, just as uh, we were discussing with my own friend here, uh, we were discussing how, you know, what other things. Usually people don't, cannot even imagine that you sell book of poems for 50 rupees and you live out of that. The thing is, I've shaped my life so very simple, down to just two pairs of clothes. Wherever you see me, you will see me in just in these two pairs of clothes. And people think like, But I have two. I wear them in turns. And they sell my book. And, and also because, uh, you know, I have taken the responsibility of the Tibetan struggle so seriously that I have not married, I have, not, I have no ambition of um, having family or bacha or <laughs> be a gari or any of that. I've just taken the responsibility of writing poetry and fighting for freedom so very uh, strong that I freed myself from the usual uh, mundanes of life. So this is what I do, and um, I'm saying I'm say, to, I've been talk, talking about the book mainly because I'm trying to sell. So, <laughs> so I'm actually advertising the book. Uh, I have a bag full of copies here, and this this makes very good gifts to your go boyfriends and girlfriends. And your teachers will love it if you get a copy because it's only for 50 rupees. And this is all what you call eco eco friendly. You know, this is all uh, recycled paper, handmade recycled paper. So the copies are here. Please buy 50 rupees only and buy you know uh, five or ten more if you want to give to your friends. Thank you very much, uh, the organizers and everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much.